<clears throat> the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a moment of silence so that we can ready ourselves through the... First John, the application of 1 John 1 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for this time where we can assemble together as believers in Christ. We know, Father, that this is critical, especially in this day and age where there are um, a lot of Human viewpoint, there's human viewpoint galore uh, that is challenging the principles of Scripture and the commands of Scripture. We know Satan is uh, alive and he is uh, busy swaying the world with things so that they would not have the time to focus on the Word, focus on what you have revealed and communicated to us to the 66 books of the Bible. But Father, we are a uh, local assembly that believes strongly in knowing you through the word, and that's why we're here. We know, Father, it's not popular, and we know, and we can actually see that through the attendance here at Church of Hope. Unfortunately, not many people today are interested in rolling up their sleeves and studying the scripture. Uh, they feel it's, it's boring, it's a, it it's, doesn't apply, but Father, we know better. We know that this is something that we need to do based on your commands, based on what it says to study and show yourselves approved, the workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God, the word of truth. So here we are. Help us now through the uh, agency of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, so that we can understand these things as he illuminates these truths. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are trekking through Acts, and remember, um, we are now going to look at the distinctions between the rapture and the second coming. And by way of review, and just so that we have things in context, the reason why I'm deviating from Acts for now is just because of what was mentioned in the last verse we were looking at which is verse 11, Acts 1, 11, which says that, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven, up into heaven? Didn't you know that this same Jesus, <clears throat> who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven? So the reason why I'm taking some time to review the rapture and the second coming is because there is a lot of views out there and uh, my intention is not to prove one point or one discipline or one uh, uh, position over uh, and above the others but to just uh, cover the basics as far as the the differences between the rapture and the second coming because they are uniquely distinct and yet you see this in songs and musics, uh, music and songs uh, people singing about you know they can't wait till Jesus returns and that kind of thing um, and we're not really waiting for his return because that's linked more to the second coming so the theology and music today is influenced by a poor understanding of scripture or doctrine. So we're not looking for his return, we're looking for, toward the, uh, forward to the rapture. Um, and so again, I intend on covering um, the various views in a, in a later 
study and maybe uh, we'll do a series on it, kind of like what we did with the um, stewardship. We'll have uh, several Sundays um, devoted to the millennium and um, the rapture and the second coming, es eschatological views. But for now, just bear with me. I'm going to make a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. And uh, also, I want you to think through these things as well. In fact, before I flip through, and some of this is review, we went through a few slides last week, but what do you know about the rapture and what do you know about the second coming? If someone were to say to you, what's the difference? Um, I'm looking forward to his coming. What's wrong with that? Is there a difference? I know we know the answer is yes, but if someone were to have coffee with you and say, well, I'm having difficulty with the rapture and the second coming. I thought they were one and the same. And that's a popular answer, actually, especially if you're post-mill. And I'll explain what that is later on. Post-trib. Um, post-trib, correct. Post-trib. What's the difference between the two? Um, the rapture and the second coming. Ascending and descending. Okay. Ascending and descending. Ascending is going up, descending is going down. Okay, what else? The rapture is a mystery, that is to say, it's a, an only, in the New Testament only doctrine. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Okay. Whatever is in the prophecy is not by the rapture. That's right. Uh, there, it's a New Testament teaching rather than an Old Testament teaching. So if you're drawing from the Old Testament, it will take you to the second coming or the millennium. It doesn't take you to the rapture. It takes you, it, it bypasses that because it's a New Testament teaching. See, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. I, where I'm going, you will be. So there's a whole bunch of things that come into play, and we'll see some of this uh, in just a moment. But it's an, a New Testament teaching only. What else? Rapture and second coming. Rapture is imminent. Rapture is imminent. Okay, very good. Okay, so the rapture is imminent. What's the word imminent mean? Anytime. Anytime. Can happen what? Anytime. So can it happen today? Yeah. Nothing needs to take place before it take, happens? So that's what it means, imminent, right? It could happen anytime. I can, I, I'm, I'm going to take my finger and, and hit enter and we could be gone. Whereas the second coming, there are signs that precede the second coming, right? Linda? Uh, the rapture is in the blink of an eye. Oh, very good. And the second coming is when we descend with Christ. So okay. All the saints that have rapture. Okay. So with the second coming, we descend, uh, we, we accompany Jesus Christ, and also, I, I think Linda was going to say this, all eyes are going to see. In fact, that's what, I, I just read the verse, right? Acts 1.11. Um, who was taken up for you in heaven he will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So it's a slow dissension with his saints. And who's going to see? Everyone. But when is it going to be chaotic? Tribulation, Tribulation and the rapture. rapture. People are going to be wondering where is everybody? Right? So they don't know what happened. Why? twinkling of an eye. We're here one day. Anybody watch Thief in the Night back in the 80s? <laughs> the, uh, the technology and the special effects were not as good as they are today. So there's this one scene where this guy's mowing the lawn like this and then the camera points up at the sun and then goes back to the lawnmower and it's all by itself. It's on but it's by itself. And they're, but basically what they're saying is the person was raptured. And then you hear within the movie, you know, airplanes are crashing, buses are crashing, cars are crashing. Why? Because imagine if you're driving and all of a sudden you're raptured out, who's going who's gonna to be uh, driving your car? Can you imagine how... I, now, I don't know if that's exactly how it's going to be. The scripture doesn't go in that direction. And that could be a problem because now a lot of innocent people are going to be hurt, I'm sure. Imagine if you're the pilot or you're 
you're in a plane where maybe you're not a believer and uh, your pilot was and so all of a sudden the, the, the plane goes down like this. And the, but why? Because the pilot's gone. See, and then all, everybody uh, on the plane is, is, uh, is gone. So I don't know how that works out because I know God is fair and I don't think he'll purposely allow certain things like that to happen. But then again, it's not mentioned. Sarah? Of, for example, a believer or any other person who doesn't know the difference? Um, well, the motivation for uh, living for, for Christ will not be there. Uh, the motivation during a crisis or a trial of some kind is no longer going to be there because not only are you going through what you're going, but if you don't believe in a rapture, you're going to go through the tribulation, which compounds the the pain and frustration. So this is stuff that like the disciples knew and yes. the old Christians knew? The, um, the, the disciples during the time of Christ was being exposed to it, especially in John 14. Don't let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going and in my father's house are many mansions and I'm going to prepare a place for you. You see. So um, so I would take that as part of the reason. And the other reason, which I think is important, is because it's proper and accurate handling of the word. I mean, if you can clearly see that there are uh, passages that relate to an instantaneous removal versus um, the returning of Christ with the saints, um, that's just good handling of the word of God. So it's there for sure. And we're going to see some of that. I think most Christians, I don't know if you would agree, but I think most Christians would kind of believe in something after death or right. after life, mm -hmm. but may not necessarily know the difference sure. between the two. So I guess they would still have the motivation to go on and live for Christ even without the difference, without knowing the difference. Because mm -hmm. us talking about it means between the two? I would say so. so. Yeah. Well, the confusion between those that see the distinctions, but there's no confusion on those who are not aware of it. So if they don't know that there's a rapture or they just know that they're going to die and be with the Lord, then they're not really too concerned about whether it's the rapture or second coming. So, but for those who see passages like what the, the few uh, examples one is imminent, one is twinkling of an eye, one is where Jesus, he, he does not land, his feet do not touch the Mount of Olives, uh, and the other one speaks of his feet touching the Mount of Olives. So there's definitely a distinction between his arrival, and in fact, some people will say there's only one return of Christ. Right, there's one return of Christ, but there's also, we have to deal with the rapture of, of the church. So depending on how you look at it, if you say one return and link that to the second coming, then that's at the back end after the tribulation. But if you're going to count the rapture, then he does appear. He does appear temporarily and we meet him in the air and he kind of takes us away. So basically, even if a person did not know about this, I would say it would and it'll probably come out as they continue to study because there are numerous passages that talk about it, especially in the Old Testament related to the second coming. So as a Bible student, we should be familiar with this. And also, mm -hmm. well, the word says we have to rightly divide the word, the word of truth. truth. That's correct. So if we don't know what's true, how can we rightly divide? That's right. That's right. So rightly dividing the, dividing the word of truth uh, is one of the reasons why we're examining these things so that we can see the distinctions. And, you know, the truth is you might walk away after you see the presentation of the rapture and the second coming and say, oh, okay, and come back next Sunday. Um, but some of you might be thinking like, oh, wow, this is great. So you mean to tell me the, the signs of his return 
You remember in, in Timothy, for example, it says, and when you see these signs, disobedient lovers of money, greedy, and so on and so forth, oh, the return of Christ is happening. It's going to be soon. But w what is that talking about? That's talking about the second coming. See? Versus the rapture, which is imminent. So, the, the, in fact, the signs that we see in Timothy, those were written 2,000 years ago. So, they actually thought they were going to see some of this during their time. But it didn't happen. So, it's, it's something uh, future yet. And that's why I said, um, and I talked to Brett about this as well, we will have a series on eschatology. Nothing lengthy, because even pronouncing it gives us a headache, right? So just looking at the various systems, being able to walk away and say, okay, I got that now. At least I have that, uh, I have that uh, understanding so that if I were to engage in a conversation with someone and they were to ask me, I, I have a view now. See, that's what happens when we study together. Eventually, as I'd read um, in Acts 1.11, we will come up, uh, up upon these verses that you can't just walk away from so easily because the angels are saying um, why do you stand here gazing into heaven this same Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come in like manner when is that when is the like manner that's right so when we start piecing it together the only return that fits with a like manner where it's slow and progressive going up and slow and progressive coming down is the second coming, not the rapture. See? So if you're into information like that, that's where this becomes helpful. You see? So, Emily? Yeah, my question uh, about is about the rapture. Mm -hmm. It's either First Thessalonians or Four. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians four, correct. Um, it did say that the rapture will happen and the son of perdition will be seated, um it would be in Israel. Because yeah. according to your graph mm -hmm. that the Mid East peace treaty will be signed. So right. is that concurrently? Because according to the Bible it says and it's yeah. or yeah. so it's together. Right. And some will uh, say that there will be a brief span of time before that actually takes place. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but so, the, go ahead. So technically, um, during this time, while we're here, there is what's, no. Yeah, what's going to happen in Israel is there's going to be a lot of turbulence. And, and then it will come to fruition that the son of perdition will sit. That's right. When? Lead them into deceive them into peace. And when does that happen? And that's when we rapture. That's out. right. We, we are raptured out first. So, and, right, so it will be mm -hmm. us raptured and then you will see. Correct. Okay. Correct. So this, this... So, the second Thessalonians passage? First Thessalonians. Oh, first. Do, the second Thessalonians do too, the, the son of perdition? That is also a passage. She, she's talking about the rapture, first Thessalonians 4. But I think she's combining the two. But it's true that he's going to be revealed when we're gone. Right? So we cannot even begin to say, I know who he is. Because we're going to be gone. So there's a chronology uh, as far as the events are concerned uh, when things happen. And then we, and that's why we study as, as uh, believers. We study the Word of God. We're not going to be able to figure everything out in this lifetime. I don't know of anybody who knows it all. But as we continue to get into the scripture, we can't help but notice some of these things. So that's why I'm taking the time to discuss briefly the rapture and second coming because of Acts 1.11. Uh, he's going to come back in like manner. So when we go through this, you'll see which out of the two are, refers to the like manner. One is slow, one is quickly. Okay. So let's go on, and uh, I want to get at least one slide in. <laughs> um, we looked at this last week. We know neither the day nor the hour. 
this event can, uh, can happen at any moment, the rapture that is. No one fulfilled prophecy stands between us today and the rapture of the church. So as Don had mentioned earlier, it's imminent. It can happen at any time. We, instead of looking for signs, um, it, it's not, it's not uh, linked to any sign as far as what Jesus said. Um, there's no sign that needs to take place in order for the rapture to occur. It can happen at any time. The second coming is marked. It's clearly marked after, <coughs> excuse me, the seven years of the Antichrist's rule. There's a seven year period. There's a seven year tribulation. And many of the scholars for end times or eschatology will say that half point, halfway through the tribulation, it now becomes the great tribulation, the unfolding of judgments, uh, Revelation 6 on to 19 or so, those judgments are coming out and hitting the earth real hard, 21 judgments, 7 times 7 times 7. And uh, God is trying to get Israel's attention. God's trying to get everybody's attention, especially his people. And they're left behind. They, did, they rejected their Messiah during the time of Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, repent for the kingdom is near. The kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. There's all kinds of statements. Je their king was in their presence, but they rejected their Messiah. And so this kingdom is stalled and moved to the future. And so Romans 9 talks about how we should be thankful, in a sense, that they rejected their Messiah because now we get to get we get to be grafted into the tree. We get to partake in the message that uh, they could have been sharing. But this it's going to be a seven-year rule, and the number of days is even emphasized. And there's a lot of prophecy regarding the period of the tribulation, and that must be fulfilled before this can happen. So again, there's prophecies, especially heavy duty in the Old Testament, that talks about the end time events. And even in passages in the Gospels, like especially like the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> then some, some examples of uh, the difference between the two. As I'd mentioned, he comes for his saints. John 14, 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the verse that uh, or the passage Emily was talking about. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, John 14, 1 to 3. He's coming and he's going to take them away. See? So he's going to take them away, John 14, 1 to 3. And then when you look at passages that relate to the second coming, he comes with his saints. This is what Linda was saying earlier. We will come along with him, Jude 14 and 15. Revelation 19, 11 to 14. Can you imagine that? We're going to accompany the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to descend at a slow rate. Everyone is going to see us. Everyone's going to be taking pictures of us, saying, what in the world is this? There's a lot of people in the air. And then we come here, and he's going to set up his kingdom. And depending on how you uh, serve today, and just prior to the rapture will determine what you'll be doing during those 1,000 years. So anybody that says, as long as I just make it, I'm going to be happy. I just, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to commit to the Lord. I don't want to do anything. I'm happy the way that I am. I just want to just be saved. And I, I use this example before. I said, it's kind of like you flying on an airplane, landing in Hawaii. Everyone is uh, exiting the airplane. And they're saying, Ray, how come you're not getting off the plane? Well, as long as I make it. Everybody else is going to enjoy where you, here you are, you're just in the plane, you're not moving because as long as you just made it. And I think that's kind of how it's going to be during the millennium. Everybody will know whether or not you were committed to Jesus Christ or not. This is not talking about your salvation. This is talking about your commitment levels. There's a difference, right? Your commitment to Jesus Christ here and now determines your rewards. Your salvation was taken care of right there on the cross, not this actual cross, but on the person of Jesus Christ who bore the sin debt on him so that by believing in him you can have everlasting life which allows you to have this harmonious relationship with God the Father thereby allowing you to be his son or daughter 
so that now as you move, as you breathe in this life, you're supposed to be representing him. Whatever you are doing, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a student, wherever you go, you represent him because you've been tagged with the title of an ambassador the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ. So you're supposed to represent. Uh, the better uh, your ambassadorship, watch this, I, I mentioned this during the barrier, your level of commitment as an ambassador is influenced by what you do as a priest. What do I mean by that? As a royal priest, you're all a priest before God. You don't tell me what you did wrong. I don't tell you what I did wrong because you and I go before God and we confess those sins to him directly, correct? Just as a royal priest or just as a priest in the Old Testament would take a sacrifice on behalf of someone, we now are the priest. We go before God ourselves because we are now a part of the royal family of God, Revelation chapter 1. Royal priesthood. So we go before God and we confess our sins. You don't have to come to me and say, you know what, I, I, I blew it again. If you do, and you're asking for prayer, I'll pray for you. But you don't have to tell me anything. You don't have to tell anybody anything because that's a privacy matter that takes place between you and God. As a priest, you go before him and say, I, I'm, I failed. I dropped the ball again. I'm confessing what I did. Lord, you know, I shouldn't have taken this watch. I'm going to return it tomorrow. And when you do that, you're confessing it before God as a royal priest. And nobody else knows. But how you live as a royal priest will influence your ambassadorship, which is what everyone sees. So if you have an anemic priestly relationship with God, it's going to reflect as an ambassador. So whatever you are at home is going to ultimately come out on the public, in the eyes of the public. But if it's not matching what's truly taking place in the home, we, call, we have a word for that. The, the scripture says that's called hypocrisy. Where at home, you're not, a, you're not acting as a priest before God. You're taking your relationship with God in a cavalier manner. And then when you go out in public, oh, praise God, God is awesome, he, he is just my anchor. And so it's just words with no depth, no real substance, because you're parroting what the scripture says, but it's not a reality to you. And what we're trying to do as we engage in the word of God is to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that takes place every time we come together. So your priesthood, hopefully when you get home, there is a sense where you say, Lord, I shouldn't have talked like this. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have taken this. That's your priesthood. And that becomes much more sensitive over time as you're maturing in the faith. If that's not happening, then you're probably over here. Your, your relationship with God is probably strained. The more you expose yourself to what he says and what he expects, the more you're going to be able to, to respond and make application to the principles as found in scripture. So your ambassadorship is heavily influenced by your priesthood. If you're a priest uh, as unto God, then that's going to come out ultimately as an ambassador. Because you're building your relationship as a priest. I mean, imagine, okay, when he went on the cross to pay the sin debt, what was that for? We tend to think it's just, oh, so I'll be saved. I won't go to hell and ultimately the lake of fire. Is that all? The reason why he paid the sin debt is so that you and I can have a relationship with God. He turned a loved one, he turned his only begotten son over to the cross so that he can adopt you and me. Why? So that we can have a relationship with him. How's your relationship with him? That's what we're talking about here. Your ambassadorship depends on your personal relationship to God as a priest. So 
Christ comes with his saints. We come back with him. And what happens? He sets up the kingdom. He sets up this 1,000 year period. He sits now on the throne of David. He fulfills the covenant that he had made. The unconditional covenants is found in the Old Testament. It's a physical, uh, geographical location, not a spiritual one. So we come back uh, with him. Going back to the rapture, again, John 14, he takes us to his father's house. And how long are we going to stay there? We will be there for seven years. And then we will return for 1,000 years. And then where do we go after that? <coughs> new earth. There's a new Jerusalem. We'll be hovered above the earth. But there will be a new earth, not heaven. So we'll have a taste of heaven when we go um, absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And depending on where we are as far as the chronology and divine timetable. So he takes us to his father's house. Now, does this encourage anybody? What's so encouraging about this? The all my neighbor. <laughs> See, it, it does provide motivation. It does provide encouragement. So let's just say you're having a bad day and then you're reminded that you're going to see Morris not only in January but as a neighbor. And what, where, what does that do? Well, that encourages us. It should encourage us because no matter what we face today, it's all temporal. Name your biggest problem and that's temporary. It's not going to last forever. The only thing that's going to last is your relationship to God and each other here. We will have more COH Christmas parties than ever when we're together in the future. See, So he takes us to his father's house. Not everybody is going to be taken. Some are going to be left behind and they have seven years to respond. And you and I know those people. And that's why we're supposed to be proactive now, telling people about Christ, so that regardless of whether or not you believe in the second coming or the rapture, one and the same or distinct, they're going to be ultimately with God. So it's not even really uh, an issue anymore as far as your eschatological view because it all worked out anyways in the end. The most important thing is, is that you're going to be face to face with him because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Second coming, the Christ and the saints stay on earth to rule. You see this in the opening of Revelation 20, 4 to 6. There's a 1,000 year period. There's the millennium period, which is really for 1,000 years. And you find that coming out loud and clear in Revelation chapter 20, 4 to 6. Now, this, the rapture, uh, again, this happens in a minute or a moment, in the twinkling of an eye or instantaneously. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, you'll see something there that kind of addresses that. So that's the rapture. It happens in the moment. It's rapid. It's quick. It's not slow. It's not a progressive thing. It's instantaneous. Second coming, though, takes time to accomplish everything involved. And remember Acts 1.11, why are you standing and gazing here? Don't you know that the slow ascent of Jesus Christ, that's exactly how he's going to come back? Two angels were the one who said this. And when you look at Revelation 19-20, to 20, there is a number of things that are going to take place in those two chapters. Regarding the second coming, or the rapture, he who now restrains, I think this is what um, Samuel was talking about, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-8. He who now restrains will be taken out of the way so that the lawless one can be what? Revealed. Revealed. So if the restrainer is not taken away, then what can we conclude about the lawless one? He's not revealed. So while people are saying, I think it's Gorbachev. I think it's this guy. I think it's the Pope. 
We don't really know. But we know what uh, the scripture says. Um, he who now restrains, and I take that to mean the Holy Spirit, will be taken out of the way, and that doesn't mean he's, he's uh, no longer going to function or operate. I think it'll be more like uh, how he operated in the Old Testament. But um, he will be taken out, and the reason why is so that the lawless one can be revealed. So right now he's not revealed. Right now he's not taken away. He who now restrains, he's not taken, taken away. So the lawless one is not currently revealed. We can make guesses, but I wouldn't waste the saliva. Um, nobody knows. No one knows the day or the hour. No one knows when any of this is going to happen. It's only my father knows, and he told his disciples in the opening of Acts. It's not for your to know. It's not for you to know. It's the prerogative of the Father. Uh, Satan will be very active during the tribulation period. Revelation 6 all the way to 19. It's a lot of chapters. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, 8 talks about what we just read there. So there's a restrainer. He's on our side, by the way. And uh, the one, the lawless one, referring to the Antichrist, he will be revealed sometime in the future. He's not, um, he's not visible as of now. He's not revealed actually as of now. Yes? You said Satan will be very active. Mm -hmm. How is he going to be active? Because Satan's characteristic is he accuses man to God. Right. So in what way is he going to be active to you? I would think that he's just going to continue to put up a smoke screen or that veil 2 Corinthians 4, 4 talks about. Um, there's going to be people who are still going to resist God. If you look at Revelation, they're the ones who are there during the time of the tribulation, they're going to go to the mountains or the caves and talk to the caves and say, hide us from the Lord. So I think Satan is going to continue to distract people. So he's, he's going to continue to do what he's doing now. But if you think about it, if the tribulation is, is, is taking place, how much time does he have left? Not much time. If you're looking at the divine timetable, let's just say the tribulation, we, took, we were raptured. Let's just say the tribulation begins tomorrow. How many years is that going to take place? How many years is the tribulation? How many? Seven. And how many years are in the millennium? So if you combine a thousand, get your calculators out. One thousand plus seven, how much is that? One thousand. That was quick. One thousand seven, right? After that? People are going to be taken out of hell. It's going to be a great white throne judgment. How long will that take? I don't know. Imagine, does he have to go one at a time? Or is he going to judge everybody at the same time? We don't know. But after that, it gets emptied. All those people will be tossed into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. So, a thousand seven years. Let's just round it up. Let's say a thousand ten years left. That's going to go by quickly. Especially if you're Satan. Your time is marked. Your time is numbered. So I think he's going to be extremely busy trying to continue to place a veil over the eyes of people. Uh, he's going to say, you know what? You're a mom. You have kids. Take the mark. God will understand. Who's going to influence? Yeah, who's, who's going to influence... Who's going to influence people during this time? Satan. So, um, I think he's going to be busy, for sure. Linda? Also, um, there's the mention of the lawless one there, and then Satan, and then there's also the beast. That's right. Is that, who's the beast? The beast is, or uh, the false prophet. There's the false prophet, there's the beast, which is the Antichrist, or the lawless one, and then the dragon. 
which is Satan himself. So you got the triune trinity, or the, tr the satanic trinity. You can see it. Uh, he's trying to mirror and reflect the triune Godhead. He's got his own satanic trinity. The Antichrist is also the lawless one and the beast. See? So titles. I mean, who here is a, a priest? Okay, four of you. Uh, who here is an ambassador? Eight of you. Who here is a soldier of Christ? See, we have different titles, right? So likewise, there's different titles assigned to um, the Antichrist. Pastor Freddy, yes. not all is a bishop, right? Hmm? Everyone is a bishop. No. Men are the of the I, personally, I take the bishop um, and the uh, pastorate, the elder, all one and the same, focusing on different uh, areas of ministry. So one speaks of its responsibility and so on. But yeah, uh, to answer your question, instead of going into, off to a message, um, yes, bishop would be confined to a man only. Same with elders. Um, let's look at the next one. So we get that, right? The, it won't be revealed, so we don't have to try to figure it out, right? It won't be revealed until the, law, the one who restrains is taken out. Now the second coming, the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon are all defeated at the second coming. Satan will be bound during the Millennium Kingdom, Revelation 19. So now people will not be able to say the devil made me do it. Satan is bound. And now people, because of the hardness of their hearts, they will still continue to refuse uh, to bow the knee to Jesus Christ or ultimately to believe in Jesus Christ. So while we have time, we should uh, start planting the seeds, as I know uh, most of you have been. But he will be bound during the Millennial Kingdom, and um, after that, that great white throne, and then he's going to be released. There's going to be one last mini war between Satan and God, and God's just going to snuff him out like that, then that's it. That's it. The rapture, the wrath of God is not intended. The word there is intended. God is not intending for us to experience the wrath of God. It's not intended for the church, but for the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5, 6 to 7, Colossians 3, 5 to 7, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and 5, 9. All address the important fact that we're not subject to the wrath of God. Okay, so if you take that to its logical conclusion, if the wrath of God is being poured out during the seven-year tribulation, we should be spared from it. Correct? Well, that's kind of what we see if that's what we're going, to, how we're going to handle the, uh, the wrath that, that God is going to pour out during the seven-year tribulation. Next, we have the second coming, the events leading up to and including his return or his second coming are described from 6 to 19 as the wrath of God. Um, or similarly, and you find that 10 times in Revelation 6, Revelation uh, 16, and 19, and accompanying verses there, Revelation 11, 18, 14, 10, and so on. The word church does not appear at all in these chapter. In fact, in our Revelation study, uh, after chapter 4, the church is gone, or at least it's not mentioned anymore. So it doesn't appear in these chapters from 6 to 19, though it appears 19 times in 1 to 3. So chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's there. And then after 3, it's gone. And once more, you see the church mentioned in Revelation 22. Okay. Regarding the rapture, the rapture of the church should be comforting and encouraging, as I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, you find some additional verses that kind of uh, offer comfort, like Philippians 3, 
1 Thessalonians 4. In fact, can someone read Philippians 3? And someone read 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 to 18. Let's see, what, what does the scripture say? Philippians 3. 3, 20 to 21? Yes. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Is that encouraging? Would you like to trade in your body for a new body? Anybody have pain, experiencing pain in their back? It's all going to be, uh, what's the word there? Glor uh, glorified body? Yeah. How about uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 to 18? Let's see if we can get some encouragement from the scripture. in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Ooh, what? Encourage one another with these words. So that is that is encouraging, right? So we have every reason to be encouraged by the rapture. It's going to in be instant. But if we know that in advance, that, that's awesome news. Everything will come to an end. We will be together, but we'll, we won't have any pain. Uh, we won't have to pay bills. We won't have to stand in the gas stations anymore. Everything is going to be perfect. So this is, uh, again, regarding the rapture, and there's other verses, James 5, 7 to 9, uh, 1 John 3, 1 to 3. And then regarding the second coming, um, the second coming is a great and glorious victory, but as such is more breathtaking or awe-inspiring than a comfort or an encouragement. So one is going to be rapid, it's going to be quick. The other one, we're going to be gliding through the sky. So that's why I said it's going to be breathtaking. Imagine that. How many of you like uh, rides that are, are high? Yeah, we, uh, my family and I... Brenda, do you like, no? Um, we went to uh, Nevada one time, or the uh, Vegas. We had to go there for uh, business, um, for the business. <laughs> and uh, my girls said, Dad, can you ride that thing? And we were driving, and this thing was way up there like this. I had to stick my head out because the, the roof was covering the, what's it called, the uh, stratosphere. And I said, of course. We dare you, Dad. I said, you girls, it's expensive. We can't. And they kept, they kept nudging me. So I said, you know what? Let's go. So I go in there, and I kid you not. I was taking the elevator. We were taking the elevator to the top, and it was shaking like this. And it, it was howling because it was going so high. And so we get off. And we're looking through this glass. You know, on the top there's a glass uh, so you can see outside. And I, I was, it, we're, we're pretty high. And so I said, okay, I think I'm ready. So I go to the lady in the middle. I said, okay, wh where do we get out to go for the rides? Oh, you need to take the elevator up. I was like, what? <laughs> I thought we were already up, but there's an up to that up. And it took us up to the top. And there were three particular rides. Emily rode two out of the three. Alex said, no, I'm not. I don't think so. I rode all three, and I tell you, it was, uh, it was breathtaking and awe-inspiring. <laughs> so maybe it's going to be similar, and, but at least we know we're under his care. There could be no problems at all. If he's going to take us and carry us through, I don't even know if, these are, if this is enough words here, breathtaking or awe-inspiring, but we will be with him, and then we will land and then we're going to break for responsibility as they're divvied out. Um, so it's comforting, uh, the rapture is comforting and encouraging, but the second coming is awesome, I think. Now regarding the rapture, a few more things here. Um, let's see how far we can get. At the rapture, the church is removed from the world, but there are gonna be people left behind. So there's gonna be a removal 
of people. And then there's going to be the remaining of people. So the rapture is the only thing that fits that, that description where people are going to be removed. Uh, again, John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Now during the second coming, Christ will come, or Christ will gather Israel to their land at the second coming after the tribulation and before the millennial kingdom age. So there's a number of verses here, Isaiah 11, 11 to 12, 41, 8 to 13, 43, 1 to 6, and these are heavy duty passages here. Micah 2, 12, Zephaniah 3, 19 to 20, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, which sometimes is taken as the rapture, but it's not. It's really the second coming. And then Mark 13, 24 to 27. Let me see, let's do one more. The rapture. The rapture of the church along with the sudden translation or transformation of saints into their glorified bodies is a New Testament idea, not an Old Testament idea. It pertains to the church. And the references for this event are all New Testament references. And so the next time we go back into this study, uh, we'll look into this. Um, and then I have a, a few diagrams to show you the distinctions between the millennial kingdoms as well. Uh, I think I have two charts. And then after that, we'll trek through the, the rest of Acts chapter 1. But I think this is important because this is how we cover the various doctrines as you go through a book. You know, some churches will teach through subjects or they take one, they take 20 verses and they make a message out of it. Whereas what I do is I take, teach through a book and whenever there's an opportunity to cover a subject that I think is important for us to know, um, then I'll deviate slightly and then pull it back into Acts. Especially if, it's, if it, it will help strengthen the position or the the point of the author. The author here is uh, uh, Dr. Luke. Okay, so let's close in a word of prayer, and then um, in two weeks, we'll, in three weeks, we will, we will continue with this. Father, thank you as always for uh, being faithful to us, in spite of the fact that we sometimes are not faithful to thee. And we know, Father, uh, that uh, our objective as a local church, first and foremost, is to continue to do those things that are pleasing to Thee. Everything we say, think, and do should bring You honor and glory. Uh, as an ambassador, we represent You to a world that is dying in their sins. And so, Father, as we continue to move along and as we continue to do those things, um, whether it's our jobs, our responsibilities at home, our schoolwork, uh, Lord, we uh, keep in mind that um, we are representatives of you and those people who are watching us will get exposure to what it is to know someone who is a son or daughter of the Most High. So I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to assemble together with the believers here in Laguna Woods. And Father, if there's anybody listening online that does not know where they stand, John 3.16 is a a promise from Jesus Christ himself, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're listening online, and if you are believing in Jesus Christ for everlasting life, according to Jesus, you've got it. So we thank you, Father, for this time. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.